because too many people worry about everything having to be pretty mm. and perfect. Mm. And, you know, yes, when I first started my course, you know, the videos weren't were a bit blurry and, you know, and the worksheets were just Word documents that I'd cobbled together. And now they're all schmick and PDFs and designed. <laughs> but the, con the content, the actual information hasn't changed. But I'm a big believer in, you know, done is better than perfect. And I just get stuff done. Hello and welcome to So You Want to Start a Business, the podcast where we interview business owners, entrepreneurs and other smart guests so we can learn their tips, tactics and strategies. I'm your host, Ingrid Thompson, and it is my absolute pleasure to bring you these interviews. Every guest has a unique perspective on business and today is no exception. That voice you just heard is the one and only Kate Toon. Kate is a copywriter, SEO lover, speaker, podcaster, TV presenter and trainer and author. I have just finished reading for the second time Kate's terrific book and it is hilarious, Confessions of a Misfit Entrepreneur. More about that later. Today we chat with Kate about how she created, started and grew her business. In fact, multiple businesses. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, and here we are with the um, very famous, or is it infamous, Kate Toon. And hello, Kate. Hello. I'm not sure I like being called infamous, but famous, thank you. Definitely famous. <laughs> um, so, Kate, to start with, just tell us what business are you in? What is your business? Gosh, this is such a simple question, but I find it so difficult to answer these days. I used to be a copywriter, so that was quite straightforward. I used to write copy for other businesses, but these days I've kind of branched out into lots of different things. So I have courses and memberships and directories and podcasts and books and all sorts of things. I guess you would call me an entrepreneur, which is a horrible word, but I guess that's what I am. It's what you are. But, but it does involve... Um the internet and social things, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, I pretty much live my day just by making comments on Facebook. That's what I do all day, pretty much. I'm a digital creature. Everything I do is pretty much online. Thank you. So when you started your business, it was some time ago when you said, you know, as that copywriter, but mm. when, how long ago is that? So I, I set out about nine years ago um, as a copywriter. Yeah, I was working in an agency um, uh, full time and I got pregnant and I couldn't keep that job because it was a sort of 14 hour day kind of job. So I took a leap and set up a freelance copywriting business. Okay. And so, so that's kind of answered the next question about why did you start the business? But it's really then what did you want from that business from day one? What was the business going to give you? I think it was freedom from um, the rat race. Uh, I didn't want to have to commute. I didn't want to have to work in an office every day. I think by that point I was a little over office politics and everything that goes along with having a real job. So I was looking for freedom. I think freedom to make my own decisions and to sort of succeed or fail on my own terms. Hmm. That's nice. And this is one of my favorite questions, is when did you realize that you were actually in business? When did your business become real? That's a great question. I don't know, maybe yesterday? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, at, at least two, two, two or three years in was the point when I thought I don't have to go back and get a real job. Mm. I think, you know, when you go out on your own, there's a bit of you that thinks, well, look, worst happens, I can always go back to you know real life so I think two or three years in I, I started to think yeah no actually I could I can make a living off this it is working you know I'm in so yeah probably about maybe three years I'd maybe say maybe three years in mm. um do you remember what it was there a point or was there something that happened that felt more real about being in business or just that sense that you didn't have to have a job I think, no, I, I, there's another milestone which happened probably about five years in, which is when I decided, maybe six even, <laughs> to build myself a home office um, in the, my back garden. So I've actually got a little hut in my back garden um, that I call the Toon Cave. Um, and it was quite an investment, you know, all up probably about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 by the time I'd done it. And that really felt like me saying, I have a business, I'm investing in my business, I'm building an actual physical structure to house me in my business. I am officially a grown-up. So that 
Maybe that's my real mind milestone. Yeah, so it's those kind of big milestones, isn't it, that gives us it that really sense? Is. Yeah. So, how did you know what your customers wanted? So you'd been working in copywriting, then you started as a copywriter, but as you said, you've moved into a number of other fields. How do you get a sense of what your customers want? I think you know I've always been a relatively good listener I'm a huge talker but I am also quite good at listening and I'm quite good at rooting out what a client is after that's what some skill you have to have as a copywriter because you're trying to get inside their head and you know I'd find you know my clients saying well yeah it's great I've got you to do this bit but I wish I could find someone who could do this or I wish I could find someone who could do that so that was part of it um and then I just you know, comments on my blog post, comments on social media from other copywriters, you know, asking me how I did what I did. And, you know, from that came another business, the Clever Copywriting School. And then a lot of people sort of struggling with SEO and being burned by dodgy SEO people. And from that grew the recipe for SEO success, which is like a course teaching people how to do it themselves. So really just listening to my customers and and being willing to just make something and see if it worked and not being too attached to it so if it failed miserably I could get rid of it as well you know so experimentation experimenting and listening is so mm. so critical and and it's very you know if there's somebody's saying oh, I wish I could get this then it's a wonderful opportunity for people to be that willing to share that with you you know it's a great opportunity to be able to respond to that isn't it it is, uh, but there's a there's a sort of double-edged sword to that. I'm I'm very much somebody who wants to do all the things, and I think often just because I could do something mm. doesn't mean I should do something. One example of that is obviously I, for a long time, wrote copy for people, and they also wanted a website, and I'm I built my own websites. So I know how to do it, but I and I could have done that, and it would have been profitable, and people would have bought it. I think, but I think there's three elements. It's like, do people want it? Will it make me money? And will I enjoy it? Mm. And one thing I've always strived to do is make sure that I actually want to do the thing because mm. otherwise, what's the point of running my own business? That's yeah, that's great advice. I hope everybody listening has taken notes of that one. And if you were just drifting off there as you listened to what Kate just said, rewind and listen to that because that was a really sage piece of advice there, a piece of guidance. Kate, you talked about a big investment. Um, you know, I guess in the early days, you as a copywriter, as long as you had a decent internet connection and a phone, um, you were, it didn't take a lot of funding to get you started. But how do you fund a business? And then how do you fund a big expansion? So, no, yeah, you're exactly right. I think I started my business on fumes. I built a WordPress site myself. I, I remember getting 100 business cards printed. I think I have 98 of them left, nine years left. Um, so, no, I spent nothing, and I'm I'm really stingy. So, you know, it took me about three years before I was willing to use an accounting program, like zero. You know, I, I, I'm reluctant to spend money, and I never have, uh, you know, had any investment or bank loans. So I invest the money that I earn. And one of the biggest things that I did in my business was create this big course, this recipe for SEO success course, which was not an investment of money, but of time. Mm. And that was a big struggle. And I really had to say to myself, okay, for the next three months, you are going to have less income because there's no way you can serve your copywriting clients and build this beast of a thing. So, you know, I, I, I took a risk. I invested time. I built it myself. And wow. Yes. And then now, it's, you know, when things start to make money, when I proved my concept, you know, so I make the thing, it's not great, but it's pretty good. I sell it to a few people, prove that it works, and then I make it better. And then I make it better. And then I hire a designer to do the logo rather than making one myself. And then I hire a, a video guy to record a video rather than doing it myself on my iPhone, you know, so little increments and, and, and being prepared for the business to be an evolution and accepting that the first version of anything I create might not be that great, but, you know, that's okay. Well, and so long as it's providing the content and the value that your customers want or your clients want, um, you know, people can be quite forgiving of a lot of that early developmental stuff, can't they? I so agree. I think mm. too, people, too many people worry about everything having to be pretty mm. and perfect. Mm. And, you know, yes, when I first started my course, you know, the videos weren't were a bit blurry and, you know, and the worksheets were just Word documents that I'd cobbled together. And now they're all schmick and PDFs and designed. But the, con the content, the actual information hasn't changed. No. It's just the presentation. Um, and as you said, 
people, it's the content that people are paying for, not the pretty pictures, you know, not to dismiss designers because they do great work, but yeah. the content has to be solid. What I mean is great design can't make bad content good. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing is people are looking for that information and if the mm. information's not there, they'll let you know certainly, won't they? Mm. They will, they will. So with that then, so you um, embarked on this, you tested it out on a few people. How do you find new customers? How do you know where they are? Are, who they are how do you find them and attract well, them to you I think the last couple of years for me have been a big learning in that because obviously the first year or so with my courses and my products I was selling them to people I already knew existing customers previous customers and you know there's only so many of those you could only sort of you know send them an email about something so many times before they say Kate I don't want it so um the last couple of years I've expanded my reach through my podcast. So I have a podcast about copywriting and one about SEO. Please um, give us the names right now because people <laughs> need to pay. Please shamelessly promote yourself. Shamelessly promote. So I have one called the Hot Copy Podcast, which is a, a copywriting podcast about copywriting <laughs> interesting title <laughs> and then the other one is called the recipe for seo success show which is kind of episodes teaching people how to diy their seo and talking to experts so that was good that brought in a complete random um, i set up groups on facebook so i have two large groups on facebook um, and they attract people in and then this year, more than any year before, I've done a lot of speaking events. So both small local business groups and also conferences as well. And um, that, you know, that introduces you to a much bigger audience. So, yeah, those three things this year have been a big part of the expansion of my reach. But the main way that I get customers is by old customers telling people. Mm. So, you know, I, I really do try and keep the people who I've lured in already as happy as I can and give them things and then they spread the word I don't actually have affiliate programs for anything I do mm. um because I, I sometimes feel that they kind of undermine the fact that people are recommending it they're like oh you're only recommending it because you're getting money so all the recommendations I get are really just from people being nice so that's been a big factor as well yeah that you know I think often people spend a lot of time and energy looking for new people in that mm. broad ocean of um, an environment of people um, and honestly the customers and clients that we have who can refer friends family colleagues others um, is it's often an untapped resource for people isn't it it really is and you know people want to trust someone they want a recommendation mm -hmm. so you know it's just getting your your name out there as much as you can but also being kind to the people who've already invested in you, I think. Yeah, and, and being kind. It's such a lovely word, isn't it, and the concept. Mm. So talking about price, um, Kate, years ago I came across your website and your video about charging and I've always, <laughs> I've often um, head, headed people, pointed people in the direction of your website to have a look at, you know, here's what to do because often I'm asked what do we do about pricing? Do you put it on your website? Do you not put it on your website? How do you talk about pricing? So if I've got two questions. Well, the first one is could you tell us about the reason that that's on your website and then what process do you decide for choosing a pricing strategy? And I don't need to know, we as the audience don't need to know your actual prices, but just what's the thinking about how do you come to a pricing strategy? Yeah, I think, you know, my whole brand and everything I try and do is about being honest and straight up and transparent. So, you know, I share a lot of information about how I charge, what I charge, when I fail, when I succeed, physical, actual numbers. I'm very honest about that. So I always found it a little bit silly when I went to someone's website as a copywriter and they'd have a page saying what do I charge and you'd get to the page and it would say I'm not going to tell you because every project is different and it used to annoy me because I was like every project isn't different you know if you've been in business for a little while you kind of have a ballpark figure in mind when someone says they want this you kind of know so why not just tell them um the pricing conversation has to be had at some point and for me you know it got to the point where I was getting a lot of tire kickers I was putting a lot of effort into proposals that never went anywhere. And it was because the gap between expectation and reality was too big. So I've never priced everything. Like when I was a copywriter, I never said, here's my price for everything I do. I came up with one 
thing that I like doing, which was websites, and I priced that. And I was very clear about the inclusions and exclusions, and there was a range of pricing. And that really helped people self-select. So people would come to me and say, I want this package. And it was great for my business because it meant I didn't, I knew that the proposal was going to get signed off because price wasn't an issue anymore. It was just about narrowing down the details. So for, for, for services, I think it's good to maybe have one thing that you do that you can package up and it is an indication of your overall pricing. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah. So I'm sure it makes perfect sense to um, people. So it's it's you chose a website as an example of the type of work that you do. Yeah. So you do copyright for a website, and that would include this and this and this. And for that, you pay this much, and that's what you get. Yeah, and that exactly. puts you in... So then you know that, okay, so if I get all of that for that much money, then if I wanted this or this, then it might be relative to that price. Exactly. You know, mm. so if someone's charging $1,000 for three pages of copy, it's a pretty clear indication they're probably not going to write your eight blogs for $50. You know, yes. that, that you can head back to Fiverr if you want that kind of pricing. So that worked well for the servicing with my product. So I have shops and courses and it's, you know, it's, I don't have some magic formula, you know. I, I, I have some products that I um, price low and stack high. What I mean by that is it's based on volume, you know, that I sell a lot of them and they're cheap. Um, and they're usually things that are at the beginning of my funnel, so low-cost things that I can sell to people and then they trust me and then they'll buy more expensive things. But my big courses, you know, they are expensive, a couple of thousand dollars to do one of my courses. But that was an evolution as well. You know, so I started off maybe charging seven hundred dollars, and then I tried to charge a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. Um, I, you know, you can always go up, but you can't. It's very hard to go down without looking like you're failing. Mm -hmm. So you know, like if I launched a course at two thousand dollars, but the next time I ran it, it was only eight hundred. People would be like, I'd a annoy the people who signed up the first round, but b people would be like, why is she doing that? Mm -hmm. So you know, I always sort of start low to medium and then increase and then, um, yeah. yeah well and too as you add more um you know as you said your content stays substantially the same but the ease of using the system the way that the um templates or worksheets work you know they get yeah. upgraded you get better quality videos people can you know all of that changes so it's yeah it, it's a different set of value isn't it it is. And I think with pricing, something really important that I've discovered is, you know, I'm sure I could charge more for, for my SEO course, for example, people finish it. And that's what they say. I would have expected this to cost more. But that is a great outcome. If someone finishes something and they feel that they've got fantastic value for money, well, then they're going to talk about it to their friends. Mm -hmm. You know, there is nothing worse than doing something and thinking that was such a waste of my money. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you know, sometimes I maybe charge a little bit less than I, sh I could because, again, for me, it's that word of mouth recommendation is so important. I have I spend nothing on advertising. So I don't buy Facebook ads. I don't buy Google AdWords, I've, you know, and I, and I never really have. I've done little odd boosted posts. All my stuff comes through branded SEO search and people recommended me. So the pricing is a part of that. You know, if you're too expensive, people won't recommend you. Yes, and, and get to the end of the course and think, wow, what did I yes. pay for? Yeah. Yeah. So, Kate, um, this, and again, as much as you want to tell us about your exit strategy, have you thought about where this goes or how it ends? That's such a good question. It's a horrible one because <laughs> no, I haven't at all. And it's something that keeps me up at night. I mm. sometimes think about doing, um, um, gosh, there's an American um, exercise instructor, Richard Simmons. I sometimes think of, do of doing a Richard Simmons. I don't know if you know, but he just completely disappeared one day. And yes. it's never, yeah. And sometimes I feel like doing that, like sometimes just switching it all off. Um, but no, I haven't really. I mean, I have financial goals, you know, I want to pay off the mortgage and get yes. to a comfortable position. And I'm only... How old am I? I think I'm 43. So I've got a bit of time up my sleeve. And I do very much enjoy um, what I do. And when I don't enjoy doing it, I will just stop doing it. Mm -hmm. I have, for everything that I've set up, all my courses and my membership, there is a caveat everywhere that says it's all ongoing. But if I decide to stop, it stops after six months, you know, and everything will be gone. So people know that, you know, like there, I can press the stop button and know that I only have six months left to 
to to, to finish yeah. off, yeah. you know. Um, wow. But no, I'm not ready to exit yet. I haven't thought about it. That's all right. It's just I, <laughs> I'm curious because it is one of the things that I do talk to people about is that, you know, where does it go in the future? Because um, it's just something to have in mind. You know, it's it's an important question, and I do feel slightly emuish about my approach. It's just like something I don't like to think about um, at the moment. Make hay while the sun shines, but I realise that's slightly naive. So I think maybe a couple more years of emuing, and then I'll start to plan my exit strategy. Well, you know, in some ways, the business that you started has gone. So, yes. you know, it's this, this constant evolution is that that's we're it. constantly exiting something that's been and, and recreating something else. So, you know, I think that in itself is an evolution, isn't it? It is. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Hmm. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, <laughs> so if you think back to the beginning, and I know that's nine years ago, so, you know, but were there things that you, you know, if you look back on that time and think, what do you really wish you'd done differently at the beginning? Or at some point, is there somewhere along I think, wow, I just wish I'd done that differently? Honestly, there's no big decision. Every decision I've made, even the terrible ones have, you know, it sounds cheesy, but I have learned a lot no, from that's them. that's great. Um, I think the only thing I wish I'd done earlier is stop worrying about my competitors and mm -hmm. stop comparing myself to other people. Um, probably about three years in, I started to really consciously reach out to my competitors. I formed a community of competitive copywriters, which then evolved into my copywriting business. But, um, you know, it was a great decision because, you know, I was watching all these other people doing so well and I was feeling bad about myself and that I wasn't achieving things. And by reaching out to them and forming this little community, I, you get to know the reality behind the business. And they were all struggling with the same things. They were all worrying that I was doing really well. And, you know, we were all looking at each other. So I wish I'd done that a little bit earlier on, but I wouldn't have had the confidence to do that on day dot. Mm. So maybe not buy those 100 business cards that I still have 98. <laughs> I think that's probably it. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've got 97 of my 100 as well. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, they're completely useless now. Um, yeah. So a slightly different question is what do you wish you'd known from the start? Or, you know, if somebody could have given you a piece of guidance or if somebody could have told you something or even since then, um, you know, is there something that somebody could have told you? Because thinking about our audience, our audience are predominantly people thinking about starting a business or in that early stage. I think I think for me, it's it's something I meant touched on earlier. There's a, an amazing guy called Robert Gerrish. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he <laughs> runs the Flying Solo uh, group, and um, and he you know gave me some advice about you know it really just because you could doesn't mean you should, but also it's so important to define your own version of success. So, you know, you could do all these things, you know, like I could launch another course and another course and I could make this one more expensive and take in more people and I could earn more money. But what do I really want out of all of this? And if I'm honest, what I really want is to work a little bit less, have a bit more free time. You know, I don't actually want any more money. I'm comfortable and I don't have huge financial expectations, you know. So, really getting to grips with what it, what it is you're trying to achieve what is your version of success because if you're not clear on that you get swayed by every shiny object and you get jealous of everybody else's success and that's been a real learning for me in the last couple of years to go yeah look at that person they're doing that great thing but I don't want to do that that is not for me that's not something I want to do and it once you start understanding that a little bit better it makes you so much happier in what you are doing I'm not sure that's very clear but yeah, no, that's, that's terrific actually and um, I'm so glad you mentioned Robert um, I know Robert very well um, from a long time ago with Flying Solo um, so my next question is about who apart from yourself has been of greatest assistance to you and to your business so Robert has been one of those people is there anybody else um, it, it, it sounds again a bit twee, but my mom and dad. So oh. my dad had a, had his, a business as well. My parents, um, I, I send them proofreading work. So uh, they do proofreading th for me through the year and I buy them both a ticket to Australia once a year to come for their holidays. Um, but they give me good advice. They're a great sounding board. They're incredibly supportive. And, you know, in a way that often parents only can be, you know, they're, 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 they celebrate my successes. You know, sometimes I'll say something to my husband like, oh, this happened and he'll be like yeah great and then move on whereas they're like well done Catherine they call me Catherine
Cameron. Uh, so they're, <laughs> they're very sage. They give good advice. They've stopped me making some daft decisions. So, yeah, I think my mum and dad. Oh, that's so lovely, isn't it? And what a great deal they've got doing the pre yeah. reading. <laughs> so this is slightly different. Who can give you good feedback or useful feedback? Um, for, for me now, um, I, what I've done is I, I've always wanted to have a group of business owners that I could talk to. Um, and unfortunately now the groups that I'm in, many of the people in it are my customers, so it's not appropriate for me to be going in there going, oh, this has happened, what should I do? Um so I've actually formed a little group of, of, of five other business owners who are sort of at a similar point to where I am. And that's my place where I go and vent and get advice and, you know, get opinions on what to do. So that, it's just a little group on Facebook that we self-formed and that's been really helpful Very for nice. me. Mm. So you use Facebook for that or do you meet in person? We, we, we meet in person when we can and, and, you know, often we're speaking at the same event or I'm in town and running a workshop and they're there. Mostly it's it's online though. It's that, you know, it's the water cooler that we all miss mm. when we're working at home um, and it's so helpful, you know, that email that you need to send that you just can't articulate and someone else just writes it perfectly for you. Mm. That's what you need, you know, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is, um, I know for myself, and this is your interview, but I know for mm. myself, it's the collegiality of um, the people I used to work with in a corporate world that yes. you know, I miss. It's exactly that, isn't it? Yes. It is. So if someone comes to you and they're super excited, they're going to start their own business, um, what would you say to them? And I know you've already covered a fabulous amount of guidance and wisdom, but what would you say to someone wanting to start their own business? I think I would be, get really practical because a lot of the advice I've given is kind of quite, you know, ephemeral as it were. Mm. I think I would be like, right, you know, what money, how much money do you want to make this year? You know, break it down. Some fantastic tools out there that will look at all your outgoings and tell you what you need to earn to cover that and what you need to earn to then make some kind of profit. You know, what tools do you need to make that happen? You're going to need a website. You know, number one, can't can't have a business without a website. And um, you know, what social channels are you going to invest in? Because you can't do all of them. Better to pick one and do it well. Um, you know, what products and services can you start selling right now rather than waiting six months to develop something amazing so just start selling something small now I think I would break it down into small steps but also just some realism because I think there's a lot of nonsense online at the moment selling this six-figure seven-figure dream yes. and uh, you know courses that you can do do not invest in a course you know <laughs> even though I have a course I would say do not invest in a course right now you know just get started you have a huge probably if you're at the point where you want to start a business you already know a huge amount of things so start with that and then learn one new thing don't go and buy a five thousand dollar course and think it's going to change your life because it probably won't um in my experience mm -hmm. um so start with the basics and yeah. start small and then evolve would be my advice that's terrific. Um, I'm sure everybody's ears are just burning in their little podcasts. So. <laughs> um, Kate, what three characteristics do you think you have that make you successful in your business? I've thought about this one. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, creativity. So I am never short of ideas. Um, you know, that can be an issue as well because they're all backing up in my mind, screaming to be done. So I, I think I'm quite creative. I think I um, I do the work. Um, so I, you know, I do come into my office and I sit there and I do the work, even on the days when I don't want to, um, and I work hard. That sounds silly, but I think a lot of people think you know they can just drop in, do the four-hour work week and be fabulously successful. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case for me. You know, I've plugged away. Um, and I think permission to fail. So I don't take myself too seriously. You know, I'm not particularly glamorous. I make typos in my Facebook posts. Um, I have things that don't work and don't sell, and I just quickly move on. So giving myself permission to not be amazing has, has been an important one because you know I am a perfectionist believe me but I'm big believer in you know done is better than perfect and I just get stuff done and then it's out there and hopefully earning me a little bit of money. 
Yeah, get stuff done. Done instead of perfect is such an important thing, isn't it? That, yeah. as you say, just create something, get it out, start, and then make it better as you go along. So exactly, yeah. So I know that's what's made you successful. Is there anything else that um, somebody for the budding startup? And you talked about, you know, finding out about how much money they need and, um, you know, what their product will be and a website and social. But what characteristics is essential for somebody getting started? I mean, I, I think to own your own business is to be, you know, to wear many hats. You have to be, I think, being organised would be an excellent asset. But I think, honestly, the biggest one is is enthusiasm. You know, enthusiasm will get you through the dark days. It will get you through the failures, the financial flops, the bad clients. If you really enjoy what you do, and it's not enough to just to be passionate. I'm not saying that because that's another kind of big thing that's sold online. Just be passionate. It will all be great. It's not true. But... If you can be organized, financially savvy and, um, you know, practical, then enthusiasm goes a long way. It really does. Like, there's no point setting up like, you know, an organic hedgehog jumper making fat company if you don't like hedgehogs and you don't like knitting, you know, just because it's going to earn you money. If you're not passionate about it and you can just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it for years and years and years and still not get bored then you've got an idea that will last, I think. Yeah, that's so true. It truly is. It, um, you've, it's that whole idea of, oh, follow your passion and the money will roll in. That's mm. not how it works. No. Um, okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, so where can people find you? I mean, what you offer is pretty terrific. Um, well, it's very terrific, really. How can people find you? Well, thankfully, you know, I'm pretty good at SEO So, um, <laughs> with my course. So if you just Google Kate Toon, you'll find all my various, I think I've got about seven websites when I last counted and podcasts and books and whatever. So, um, yeah, if you Google me or search me on Facebook, I'm sure, you'll, sure something of mine will pop up. And then it's a smorgasbord for people to select from. Um, I like that, yeah. <laughs> a, little, a, 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 cheese, a cheese platter of, of offerings. That sounds just lovely. Thank you so much for your interview. Um, is there anything else that I haven't covered that you would like to say or are we pretty close to done? No, we're done. I just, you know, wish everyone who's thinking about starting up success, you know, and uh, give it a pop. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, you know, as I said, you can always go back to your day job, but you probably won't. Once you break, <laughs> once you break free, you'll never want to go back. <laughs> Indeed. Kate, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. How much fun is Kate? I didn't really want our conversation to end. When you think about it, what was the most useful for you in our conversation? I just love what she said about getting stuff done and about b b done being better than perfect or pretty. So if you want more about Kate, head over to katetoon.com, K-A-T-E-T-O-O-N.com. And there's a gateway there to everything else that Kate does, including that terrific book, Confessions of a Misfit Entrepreneur. Her SEO course, her copywriting, it's all there. Thanks so much for listening. And if you are thinking about starting your own business, you might like to take the Business Startup Readiness Assessment. It's designed to help you find out how ready you are to create, start and grow your own business. Head over to www.healthynumbers.com.au slash quiz. And as always, you can find full transcripts of all the podcasts over on my website, all the links and the show notes. And remember, ideas without action, well, they're just that, they're ideas. So what action are you going to take today? Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time. Ingrid Thompson, Healthy Numbers.